The Tolkien Road, Episode 126, Tolkien, Miracles, and the Way Things Really Work. Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, a long walk through Middle Earth. On this episode, we explore one of my favorite Tolkien letters, number 89, and consider Tolkien's views on miracles and the greater reality behind our world. This is a mind-blowing letter and one of my favorites. You won't want to miss this one. Before you forget, please head on over to iTunes and leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback. It's a great way to show your support for the show and takes less than a minute. You can also stop by TolkienRoad.com, learn about previous episodes, and say hey. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Tolkien Road and on Twitter via at Tolkien Road. Thanks for listening and enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, episode 126. Tolkien, resurrection, and the way things really work uh, concerning letter 89 in the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien. Wow. That's an impressive title for the podcast. Well, uh, you know, I don't know if that's what I'll actually call it um, when I actually record the intro and type it out and everything, but that's basically what we're talking about. Letter 89. Letter 89 and the letters. No, I liked it. I really liked it. So, special thanks to our executive producers, William Hutton and Justine Lloyd, as well as our other generous patrons. Yes, thank you If you'd like to contribute to the Tolkien Road, please visit us on patreon.com slash Tolkien Road or just TolkienRoad.com. Either one works. Yep. Um, So, we're at a point, again, you know, we, we had a we had a special episode last time on the future of Middle Earth. That's part one. If you haven't listened to it yet, go back and listen to it. Let us know what you hope to see with the future of Middle Earth in terms of where Tolkien's works go next. Um, obviously, not in the sense of Tolkien telling new stories, but in the sense of what you hope happens in the future now that we have movies of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, mm-hmm. Silmarillion, or you know, would you like to see a Silmarillion movie, TV show, whatever? We want to hear about all your ideas. We told you our ideas and what we hope is kind of going to happen uh, in the future, in the near future. And we want to hear from you guys now because we're yeah. going to do our next episode on your feedback. And um, so we want to, we want lots of feedback. Tolkien Road Podcast yeah. at gmail.com. If we don't get feedback, there's no part two. So. Right. Or we'll just, you know, sing songs. We'll, yeah. we'll just, um, we'll do our best inter- interpretations of the various songs of the Lord of the Rings. There we go. There we go. Like the bath song and stuff like that. That's right. Yeah. Uh, Only the bath song. Only the bath song. It'll just be the bath. Different, different interpretations. The bath song. Heavy metal, hip hop. Yeah. (laughs) The bath song as a rap. Bath song in the classical form. Bath song, country music style. Yeah. You know, you know, we don't want to see that happen either. So provide (laughs) us feedback. Okay. Um, Consider yourself warned. That's right. Yes. That's right. So, um, yeah, so we're doing letter 89, and I love this letter. Um, You mentioned this is your first time reading it, and you were like, this is a weird letter. And it is a weird letter. Tolkien himself admits as much uh, near the end of it. Mm -hmm. You know, he says, this is, well, this is turning into a peculiar letter. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, he does. I love the word peculiar, by the way. But there's good stuff in it, right? There's really good stuff. Really good stuff. Yeah. It's a weird letter, but there's really good stuff. And, you know, we might expect it to be weird because he was just, he was writing this to Christopher and not to all of us. He was writing it to one person. Right. right? To someone that he had an intimate relationship with, right? And a very special father-son bond. So, yeah, you're going to write differently. Right. those kind of people. Exactly. So... Um, you know, the context of this and what you notice is that if you look at the letters that come before and after, uh, they're basically all to Christopher for a good section of the letters of, of J.R.R. Tolkien in 1944. Wait, of course, I, I'm sorry. Can I ask a real quick question? It's just about the letters in general. Okay. Are they organized chronologically? Yeah, they, are. they are. Okay. So they're organized chronologically and, 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 you know, we don't know how you know we we don't know all the other letters he was writing during this time you know all we know is the letters we have in this book there presumably there are other letters that just didn't get included there's other parts of letters because you notice on this one that there's you know there's the ellipses mm-hmm. 
little dots that come at the beginning. So you know, maybe he maybe he told the entire story of the of the fourth age of Middle Earth, and you know, at the beginning of this letter, and they just weren't willing to share it. <laughs> um, and Christopher's keeping that all to himself. Yeah, but or maybe I, it was just something too personal that they didn't want published. Probably that's probably yeah. what it is. So there's you know there's there's this huge span in 1944 where he's writes a lot of letters to Christopher and that's because Christopher was a member of the Royal Air Force and it was mm. during, you know, kind of the height of World War II. Yes. Shortly after the invasion of in fact he wrote one of the earlier letters on D-Day, not oh. maybe knowing or not yet knowing that it was D-Day. Wow. Um but this is of course a few months after D-Day, June 6, 1944. This is in uh November. early November. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is right around the time that the Battle of the Bulge is getting ready to happen, right? So, you know, the height, height of the war in Europe, right? Like, lots of people dying on both sides. Um, and Christopher is in the Royal Air Force. Uh, so, you know, he's part of, um, you know, he's part of the war effort right. on the side of the Allies, right? right? Yep. So that's the context for this. And, and I want to say, like, um, you know, I wasn't planning on doing this letter because of our current uh, kind of contemporary context, but you know, it's been a, it's been a, uh, it's been a rough week on a number of levels. And it's just like, it's just, it just seems, it's not like this is, it, it's feeling less and less like rough weeks are an anomaly in the world or not. Mm. You know, it's, it seems like, <laughs> and I think this has always been true. We, be, we become more and more aware of just how messed up a place the world is. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course you have the shooting in Las Vegas, um, on Sunday night and into Monday morning. And, just the horror and the tragedy, like what in the world? We still don't know why this man did what he did. Um, yeah. Same day you have uh, one of my favorite musicians, shocking, you know, kind of surprisingly dies, goes into cardiac arrest, Tom Petty, um, yeah. who I've been just jamming to ever since. Um, you know, just lo- love that man and his songs. Uh, I can't claim to have known him, obviously, but uh, but just the person that, you know, you, you part, part a person communicates part of their soul and their art. Yeah, and yeah. Um, and just you kind of go deeper into your appreciation of an artist when that kind of thing happens that you may have loved on one level before, mm-hmm. but you go even deeper when you lose them and you realize. Yeah. And I'm just as I go deeper into petty stuff, I'm like, this guy was amazing. What an amazing songwriter! And there was just a there's. I mean, I would I would never call him Tolkien esque, but like, there is a. There's a like it's funny because there's a certain melancholy in his music mm-hmm. that I've that I've really woken yes. up to in the last couple of days. Yes. Because you think of Petty as kind of an, a more upbeat kind of artist, right? Like he's not like not like all happy songs, but his you know his his songs are like they're, bow, they're pop yeah. they're pop they're pop songs, you right? You can car dance to them. Like yeah. you can do the you sing along the to them. Seat, drive to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. You agree? You listen to him with the family. You listen yeah. to him with friends. You listen mm-hmm. to him when you're having a good time, right? Mm-hmm. But. In all of his songs, there's this like melancholy. And you there's, listen to the lyrics; like they're, they're they're not upbeat lyrics for the most part. No, but there's this. They're not like depressing, but no, they're, they're but not, there's a sadness. There's there a, is there's a sadness. that there's that existential sadness mm-hmm, in them, mm-hmm. you know, um, that I think was yeah. very much a part of Tolkien's own art, you know, right? And just kind of the, um, you know, almost like a reflection of the human condition, right? Which, apart from the saving grace of God, is a very sad melancholy thing right and i don't know and i'm not going to claim that to know where tom petty stood religiously um what his belief system was but um but no i feel like i feel like a lot of his songs were kind of a reflection on just on the human condition just as is yeah i mean i think that was one of one of the sources of their appeal um you know and that's that existential sadness. Like that's something mm-hmm. we all know. I mean, any human being can just take a step back from, if you take a step back from your own situation, if you just pause to kind of reflect on yourself and your place in the world and the place of the vast, you know, the vastness of humanity and our place in the cosmos, we have such a brief life. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you know, we, we try to find our joy in various places, but when we reflect on who we are, like, even 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 in the even when you feel like you have the grace of God, mm-hmm. right? Even when you feel like you found what you're looking for, <laughs> in the existential sense, there's still a sadness. There's still an uncertainty. Like there's still a, um, there's still a, like I was reading um I was reading one of the Psalms this morning, and it's just like God, where are you? Mm-hmm. You know, I thought you were there. Where are you? You know, and um, 
you know, so it's like, you know, religious or not, this is something that kind of melancholy is the thing that we face regardless, right? Yeah, regardless. And I think that in and of itself is also a very, um, you know, we've talked about this with just with the, in the Tolkienian sense of the long defeat, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just this idea of you may win the battle, right? But you still got the war mm-hmm. to deal with. And um, it's not looking too good for the outcome of that war in yeah. general. Um, so it's just kind of this idea of your sufferings and joy mingling, right? Absolutely. Of, you know, which is the cross, yeah. really. At the, you know, the cross is kind of the symbol, right, of, of isn't there like a hymn or something that says, never did such joy and sorrow meet? Um, I think so. So anyway, it's just kind of that, that idea, right? Right. As while well, you're, you know, you have these high points, but then you're also, they're mixed with these you know, just in just the, you know, this darkness as well. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, I was reading, I was listening to his song, learning to fly this morning, Tom Petty. And, um, which is one that I've, you know, I've known for a long time. I had, um, I had the cassette of into the great wide open, which this is the opening track of this back, you know, song back in, um, gosh, must've been 91 or 92. You know, Tom Petty was one of the first artists that I really like kind of, Uh, fell in love with. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I had this cassette and I remember hearing this song, uh, listen to it dozens of times have kind of grown to appreciate it on different levels over the years. I was listening to a live version of it this morning and, you know, um, I, I just, I was thinking even more deeply about the lyrics in light of his death and in light of what was happening and in Las Vegas and just the world and the spiritual state of things. Mm-hmm. Right. The spiritual mm-hmm. state of thing, you know, well, I started out the, here's the lyrics. Well, I started out down a dirty road, started out all alone. And the sun went down as I crossed the hill and the town lit up and the world got still. And the refrain is just brilliant. I'm learning to fly, but I ain't got wings coming down is the hardest thing. Um, you know, so it's like, you know, we all sense, and this is the thing, right? Um, we're, we're both, we're both Christians. Like we feel like, you know, we, we have kind of made a conscious act of, you know, I believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the salvation, mm-hmm. right? He is mm-hmm. the resurrection and the life, right? Yes. Um, but there, for every human being, regard whether they come to that or not, there's a there's something that precedes that. But I think in each of us, there's a sense in which we all feel like we're called to learn to fly somehow, right? Not in the mm-hmm. sense of like birds fly per se, but but we're all called to learn to fly, to experience that joy, that freedom of, of like yeah. flight of yeah. this, this spiritual Absolutely. thing. Right. I yes. mean, that's what it means. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm learning to fly, but I ain't got wings. And mm-hmm. that's, that's our situation as human beings. Right. I'm learning to fly. I feel like in whatever way I'm called to learn how to fly and to be free. Uh, you know, but how do I do that? Mm-hmm. Right. And, mm-hmm. and even every time I feel like I do manage to find that place, I had come down and that down. coming down is even harder, mm-hmm. right? That coming mm-hmm. down, that landing, that it's a crash landing. Yeah. Right? Well, again, it's that joy, right? Followed by the suffering, the sorrow. Right. Um, I mean, you know, great lyrics. Well, the, the good old days may not return and the rocks might melt and the sea may burn. That, that one right there, I love that because, you know, we all want to go back to the good old days. We all got this nostalgia. Like we all, you know, probably if you're listening to this mm-hmm. and you're older, you want to go back to when you were a kid. You want to go back to sometime when you were younger. Glory days. Um, the glory days, right? Yeah. You want to go back to the golden age of whatever. And that's a myth. That's always a myth, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's never, it was never really like that. Back. No. You were right. just ignorant. Yes. <laughs> thing, probably. Yeah. Rose colored glasses on. Right. But, uh, and the rocks might melt and the seas may burn. That's an apocalyptic image, mm, right? It really is. Um, yeah. You know, that's, I mean, that's, that's almost, that's probably, that might be just like from revelation or something like that. Mm-hmm. The rocks might melt and the sea may burn. Um, you know, where, you know, what's, what's the future got in store for us? It's just, it's an increasingly scary place. Um, some say life will beat you down and break your heart, steal your crown. So I've started out for God knows where, I guess I'll know when I get there. Um, you know, just, like the, it's the simplicity of these lyrics that that gets me because they're just so, so direct, but profound at the same time. Mm-hmm. And you like, you find yourself just listening to them, like driving down the road mm-hmm. on going on vacation or something like that. And you're just like, Oh yeah, I love this song. You turn it on and you're just like singing along. Mm-hmm. But then you stop to think about it more deeply and you're like, it's harrowing, right? It's, it really is. It just, it, it just captures the human condition 
so well. Um, and, um, and, and so, you know, I, you know, I hope I'm nobody's annoyed by the fact that I took a minute in the context of this Tolkien, Tolkien letter to like pay a little tribute to Tom Petty, um, and to talk about the state of the world, but I feel like it's, it's all relevant and it's all tied together and, mm-hmm. and who, you know, in the whole big picture, this is the moment we're in right now. Tolkien's letter 89, um, you know, he was dealing with a world that was equally, if not more messed up than ours is right now. Right. Yeah. I mean, millions of people had died in this war by now. This is 1944. World War II started the official start September 1st, 1939. Right. Over five years ago at this point, of course, Japan, uh, had been doing, had been, the Japanese empire had been doing things since, uh, you know, 1933, maybe even before, so there's an argument that it was World War II was going on even before that. Mm. Um, but, you know, this is just a war. I mean, war was becoming commonplace, it must have felt like, you know? Yeah. Just being at war. Because World War One had not been over that yeah. long before Ta- this one started. Think about the stuff Tolkien had, had gone through. I mean, think about sending kids off, your, your own sons off to war. Knowing when, what you're sending them when into. You, when you had experienced it yourself. Yeah. No, I first hand. Yeah. No, I can't even. That's, I mean. That's, um. That take that takes it to a whole other level of of difficulty and you know sadness, yeah. melancholy. Yeah. Uh, amen. Amen. And so, you know, let's launch into the discussion of the letter. So, November nineteen forty four, um, he starts off, or at least we 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 get uh, started with your reference to the care of your guardian angel makes me fear that he is being specifically needed or especially needed. Yeah. Um, so, apparently, Christopher had written a letter to him referencing his guardian angel Mm -hmm. and um what is a guardian angel um and in catholicism actually we just had the feast of the guardian angels the other day yeah Um, we did and you know and so basically in catholicism uh guardian angels and and i'm not looking at the catechism or anything right here so i might not get this 100 percent right but the idea here is that we all have uh guardian angels at least when you're baptized you're given a you're given Mm -hmm. a guardian angel Mm -hmm. right a, a specific angel that has charge over your, over your well being. Right, and right? their job is to protect, guide, direct. Right. Yeah. And and so Tolkien reflects a bit on that that whole idea here in this in this area, and he says, um, it also reminded me of a sudden vision. So this is a mystical letter, right? Tolkien's talking about various visions yeah. he's had. It also reminded me of a sudden vision, or perhaps a, 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 a perception which at once turned itself into pictorial form in my mind. I had not long ago when, su- when spending half an hour in St. Gregory's before the Blessed Sacrament, uh, when the qu- quadrant ore was being held there. Um, so he's in, he's, he's, he's in a church mm-hmm. uh, in the midst of Eucharistic adoration. So what is a quadrant I have no idea. Quar- I didn't it, look it up. It's footnoted. Let's see here. Hold on. I can find it. It's footnoted. Hold on. I got it. Okay. Also known as the 40 hours devotion, the Blessed Sacrament is exposed on a throne in a monstrance. And the faithful pray before it in turns throughout 40 hours. 40 hours. This length of time was probably fixed on as the period during which Christ's body rested in the tomb. Okay. So okay. Cool. All right. So. So he's basically at adoration. He's at adoration. That's okay. right. Uh, I perceived or thought of the light of God and in it uh, suspended one small moat or millions of moats to only one of which was my small mind directed. Glittering white because of the individual ray from the light which both held and lit it. Um, so, you know, we think about like, if you ever see like sun shining through a window Mm -hmm. and an otherwise not lit, not sunlit room, you know, you'll often see like dust, like little particles, little particles of dust. Mm -hmm. And that's what he means by a moat, right? Right. Like Mm -hmm. a moat is a speck of dust. Right. 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 Uh, it's it's an antiquated term. And so he's thinking about like, okay, you know, the rate, the rays of light, you know, that, that dust that you see swirling in the air, the rays of light shining through it. Mm -hmm. And he has this thought. Um, let's see here. Not that there were individual rays issuing from the light, but the mere existence of the moat and its position in relation to the light was in itself a line and the line was light. And the ray was the guardian angel of the moat, not a thing interposed between God and the creature, but God's very attention itself personalized. And I do not mean personified by a mere figure of speech, according to the tendencies of human language, but a real finite person. Right? So he's saying like, I had this vision that every speck of creation, every individual dust moat has, a guardian, has a guardian angel, right? It has a guardian angel that's responsible for it. And what is that guardian angel? It's God's love personalized, right? Not, 
not, and he says, he makes this point, not personified, but right. personalized. What does that mean? Personified means is it something you do literarily, right? It's person, personification is... Well, it's to give life to something that's not a living thing, right? Well, not quite. Personification is to give pers- kind of imaginarily... Mm-hmm. imaginatively give personal qualities to something that's not really a person or it's not really alive. Right. Yeah. Right? They give qualities of something that's living to something that's not living. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's, I, I, that sounds good to me. Sorry. I'm a little bit of a nerd when know, it comes to being are. specific about this that's stuff. That's okay. And there's actually a word which, which slips my mind, which is different, which is a, is personification on a grander scale, literally. But, um, mm-hmm. but that's, that's neither here nor there. What he means is, that this is an actual, that he has this vision that every moat has an actual person who is a spiritual person who is attendant to that speck of dust, right? That God mm-hmm. has such care for the entirety of his creation that every individual speck, and dare we say, atom, <laughs> mm. right? Of all the just unfathomably large number of atoms pro- that there really even are in a, in a, in a speck of dust, because there's like trillions and quadrillions of atoms and a speck of dust, mm-hmm. um, that each one of those things has God's per- personal, personalized Guardian angel attention to mm. it. That, right? that like takes that, the scripture of, um, you know, where, where he's talking about, don't worry about tomorrow for, you know, cause tomorrow will worry for itself. Like just think about the sparrow, yeah. right. And doesn't God, God sees every God cares for the sparrows, right? And for the wildflowers of the field. How much more then will he care for you? Someone right. that's made in his own image. That takes like that whole idea to just another level. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, he, this is a little reflection of Tolkien's and, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I love Tolkien's. This is one of the reasons I love Tolkien so much because he takes something like seemingly so mundane like this mm-hmm. and just goes off on this flight of fancy. And, and he realizes toward the end of his letter, like, I'm probably not making any sense to you. And, <laughs> you know, your dear old dad just loves you and I'm weird. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's me. Mm-hmm. I feel like, you know, so often I want to post things on Facebook and I'm just like, <sighs> people just don't understand, like, won't understand me. <laughs> like, people will be like, John's weird. Um, and, and probably that's the best thing they can hope for from some of the things that I, that I would want to post. And I just want to say, like, people, God loves you. Like, mm-hmm. like I know sometimes this world sucks and it, and it hurts. And, but, God loves us mm-hmm. and, and we need, we need to realize this. We mm-hmm. need to know this. Um, and, uh, so, okay. Thinking of the whole, thinking of it since for the whole thing was very immediate and not re- recapturable in clumsy language. Certainly not the great sense of joy that accompanied it in the realization that the shining poised mode was myself or any other human person that I might think of with love. It has occurred to me that I speak to, <laughs> it has, I mean, it has a lot of parentheses. Yeah. It has occurred. I, I completely lost it. All right. It has occurred to me that I speak differently and have no idea whether such a notion is legitimate. It is at any rate separate from the vision of the light and the poised moat. This is a finite parallel to the infinite. As the love of the father and son who are infinite and equal is a person. So the love and attention of the son who are infinite, who are infinite and equal is a person. Oh, you just read that again. Oh, I'm sorry. So. Okay. Uh, I, I got it. As the love. Finite but divine, i.e. angelic. Is a person. So the love and attention of the light to the moat is a person that is both with us and in heaven, finite but divine, i.e. angelic. So he actually, it's kind of cool because he actually gives a kind of a, a little glimpse into the idea of, into the doctrine of the Trinity, right? Like that, right. that <clears throat> God, the father, the son is the perfect image of God, the father, right? Mm-hmm. The father beholds the son. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's so perfect an image, in fact, that it is a, completely a person like the father is, right? Yes. The father beholds the son, looks upon him with perfect love. The son looks upon the father, reflecting back that perfect love. And that love is so perfect that it forms another person, Uh, right? mm -hmm. Holy Spirit. Now, we use terms like form. These are, you know, terms that we have to use to describe these things because in the end, we can't, we don't have words that really do justice to what the Trinity actually is. Right. 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 Um, But that's what Tolkien is saying here. And, you know, on some smaller level, that mode receives that same attention, receives a, a personified love, per, personalized love from God, right? Right. Now, is he is he saying here that that basically this moat that has this light, like this light attached to the moat, is a reflection of the relationship between the Father and the Son? Um, he, or is he just... Comp- well, all love is, right? Like, all, all love 
truly is a <laughs> a reflection of yeah in some in some small in some more finite way right all true love is that same love because God is mm. love right yeah God is what love is love is God God is love right? right and the image of the Trinity is is the um, is the ideal right of perfect love it's right. the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit one three persons but one three separate persons but one unified three and one being three right. beings and one no 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 one three, being one being three, <laughs> three God persons. three persons one God that's right there okay you go. three persons one God and that unity of the three in one that is the reflection of perfect love right ah. It's getting very meta here. It is perfect love. It's not a reflection. It's perfect it love. It is perfect love. Right. It is what love is. And that's what we strive for in our relationships with those that God brings into our lives here on earth. And with God, And too. with God. Right. Yeah. Right. We okay. want to be drawn into that. Into that perfect into that, union. Into that reality. Because that mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's reality. Right? Mm-hmm. Anything less than that is not, you know, is a shadow. Right? Gotcha. Yes. It's broken. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, but you know, so you know, profound stuff. We got to move on though, because we're gonna we're gonna get this. This is gonna go long <laughs> if we don't. Okay. So he he moves from this reflection. Um, it but and, and just to f- close that out, he says, "I have with me now a definite awareness of you, poised and shining in the light, though your face, as all our faces, is turned away, is turned from it. But we might see the glimmer in the faces and persons as." apprehended in love of others. So he's saying, I'm comforted, even though you're in the midst of war, that, that God is paying attention to you in this way, right? That because God, he's paying attention to this moat. Right. Which means he's all the more attention is being paid to you. Right. Yeah. That's it. Can I, I just want a, a quick comment here just about, cause he uses the word vision, right? Mm-hmm. He says, this is a vision. And, um, I feel like this is something that, um, I've kind of been thinking about lately just because this other book I'm reading talks a lot about visions. And so it kind of brings to mind the question, like, what is a vision, right? Mm-hmm. What is the definition of a vision? Because I think they're different for every people, right? And I think there are some visions that you don't realize are a vision until you're removed from it and you're looking back on it and yeah. saying, oh, that was, you know, that kind of influenced or had a very special um in, you know, influence on my life, right? That impacted me in a very specific, special way. So I think that visions, I think visions is a very broad. So as I used to think of visions as like these supernatural, you know, like people appearing, you know, like God or Jesus appearing to somebody, mm-hmm. you know, as a lot, of, a lot of the saints reported visions yeah. of Jesus. Um, and even some, you know, living people have as well. Um, but I think that visions can take different forms based on oh yeah based on the purpose right that they're being sent for and to the person that they're being sent to mhm and i think that sometimes a vision you don't realize was a vision until after the fact and i wonder if that may be going on right here oh i, I he, as he's reflecting on it he's like oh my gosh that was a vision that god sent to me as a means of comfort it yeah. was like a super, and it was like an actual grace. Like, it was this supernatural, you know, thing that happened as a way of comforting Tolkien. Oh, I mean, I think you're spot on. I mean, I think, you know, the the visions, the various visions that have happened with different individuals down through the years, um, they aren't, you know, they aren't the end-all, be-all themselves, but they are, they do have a specific purpose and they are true, mm-hmm. right? Right, right. Because, um, because God is pure spirit, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. God is pure spirit. So mm-hmm. he's invisible, right? right? He's invisible on the material and on the, in the physical realm, yes. right? And in, yes. in the realm that we see with our senses, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but he's, but he, he's real nonetheless physically. And so how does it, in a special way, this is, we don't want to get too far off track in terms of like, you know, going kind of down, uh, this is a wide road to go down. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't mean to get us super off track. No, but it's fine. But, but to be to be sure, like he does sometimes grant visions to people. Oh yeah, that absolutely. are specific and and show him in certain ways, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Those are not necessarily definitive visions of who God is. Not necessarily like uh, visions of God on a 
that like the rest of us are necessarily beholden to, like, Mm -hmm. like we have to believe or something like Mm -hmm. that. Right. Right. But nevertheless, they are, you know, that God, God can do that. Right. God is, God is perfectly free to do that, to communicate himself to people in certain ways that almost have a physical, you know, could have a physical manifestation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, the only exception, of course, to everything I've just said is, would be Jesus himself becoming incarnate, taking on human flesh. Right. So that, that is a, that is a, presenting of himself to the entirety of the human race, not to just one person. Sure. Right. Yeah. So, um, anyway, interesting question. All right, yeah. but let's, let's do move on to the next section here. Okay. Or else this is going to become a two part episode. <laughs> um, on Sunday, Prissa, so Prissa is there is Tolkien's daughter. Um, he had three sons and one daughter. Um, uh, and she's actually, she's still with us. She's still alive, I believe. Hmm. And I cycled in wind and rain. Prissa and I cycled in wind and rain to St. Gregory's again, the, the parish she goes to. Prissa was battling with a cold, another disability, and it did not do her much immediate good, though she's better now. But we had one of Father C.'s best sermons and longest, a wonderful commentary on the gospel of the Sunday, healing of the woman and of Jairus' daughter. Um, so the woman, the woman he speaks of here is the woman who was um, hemorrhaging. hemorrhaging, and right. she touches the she hem of his garment. Up to, yeah. And he's Jesus like, wait, who did that? Yeah. Right? Because he felt... He felt the power go out of him, right? Yeah. And she's immediately healed. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then, uh, and then they've been begging him to go heal this little girl mm-hmm. um, who's Jairus's daughter, mm-hmm. and um, and she dies, right? Right, and then he decides to go after she dies, mm-hmm. and this is one of the first cases where he he wakes he basically wakes somebody up, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. from death. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, beautiful, beautiful little scene in scripture right there. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, there's a, you know, and this occurs in three, in three of the different gospels. This scene occurs in three of the different gospels. Priscilla was especially amused by his remark that St. Luke being a doctor himself did not like the suggestion that the poor woman was all the worse for them. So he toned that bit down. So, um, so this is a little joke where she's just basically, he's basically saying like, the the joke is that St. Luke was a doctor mm-hmm. and there was a comment there was a bit in there about the doctors were not able to help this woman and uh, some of the other got in the other gospel accounts and Luke uh, didn't mention that because he was a doctor himself. How he didn't like funny, I didn't pick up on that. Yeah, so that's a you know interesting little tidbit. <laughs> funny little tidbit aside. That is. Um But Father C also incorporated illustrations from modern miracles. Alright. So this is a discussion. Tolkien has a little discussion about his view on miracles here. Mm-hmm. And he focuses particularly on the place of Lourdes in France. Mm-hmm. Now, for a little history of what Lourdes is, Lourdes is, um, gosh, I need to look it up on the map, but basically I believe it's in the south of France. And it's especially well known for being the apparition of Our Lady of Lourdes in the 19th century. So. Uh, let's see here. It is, yeah, it's in like the South of France, just across the border from, uh, on the edge of the Pyrenees, just across the border from Spain. So, um, and it was in 1858 that, uh, Bernadette, who was this little girl living in, uh, Lourdes, Mm -hmm. this little, like poor servant girl, um, was living in Lourdes and she started having visions of the Virgin Mary and, uh, and, you know, she had these various visions over the course of some time and people were just like, oh, she's crazy. But then people started getting healed and like lot, I mean, you know, it's one of the most visited places now in a, like a religious destination right. in the world. So it's the water there, right? It's right. the water of Lourdes that, and, um, and there's been, you know, just probably in the thousands of, of healings that have been claimed there over the years. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, just for a quick aside on this. That doesn't mean that the Catholic Church says all thousands of every time somebody claims to have been healed at Lourdes that the Catholic Church says, oh, that's true. Mm -hmm. Um, The Catholic Church actually has attested to a number, something, I think, I think it's in the neighborhood of like 70 or maybe more by now, um, healings that it attests to and says, yeah, we think this actually happened and it's miraculous. 70? Yeah. Okay. Um, but there's been thousands more claimed. I see. Right. Gotcha. Um, but the, the church actually has a, um, actually has a medical bureau set up for Lourdes specifically to investigate various claims of, of wow. healing. And it puts them through a ri- pretty rigorous process. Uh, I was reading up on this and it basically says for a cure to be recognized as medically inexplicable, certain facts are required to be established. The original diagnosis must be verified and confirmed beyond doubt. 
The diagnosis must be researched as incurable with, cur- with current means, mm. although ongoing treatments do not disqualify the cure. The cure must happen in association with a visit to Lourdes, typically while in Lourdes or in the vicinity of the shrine itself. Uh, the cure must be immediate. The mm. cure must be complete. And the cure must be permanent with no, mm. no recurrence. So they, even after that, they're still not allowed to pronounce it miraculous. They just basically attest to those things and to say it's medically inexplicable, right? And then they pass it on to the church and say, okay, then the church has its own, for all miracles, the church has its own kind of set of tests that it puts it through. And hmm. the church probably rejects 99% of claims of miracles for, you know, maybe even higher percentage than that. So this is not a thing where, you know, oh, those you know, crazy Catholics will just believe anything, you know, they're, they're claiming these cures. No, I mean, in Tolkien, Tolkien kind of mentions this as an aside later on in the letter that, you know, this, these are that the, many of the cures at Lourdes are well attested to, right. Where where he talks about the little boy who was cured. So he references, uh, he references, uh, Let's see. Boy. So the first, well, is, the, is that the first yeah, one? Yeah, that's the first no, one. No, he says, he says something about the woman. So the, um, oh, you're the right. similar case of a woman similarly afflicted owing to a vast uterine tumor who was so just cured. just like the woman in the Bible. Right. Yeah. Who was cured instantly at Lourdes so that the tumor could not be found and her belt was twice too large. And the most moving story of the little boy with tuberculosis peritonitis who was not healed and was taken sadly away in the train by his parents, practically dying with two nurses attending him. As the train moved away, it passed within sight of the grotto. The little boy sat up. I want to go and talk to the little girl. In the same train, there was a little girl who had been healed. And he got up and walked there and played with the little girl. And then he came back and he said, I'm hungry now. And they gave him cake and two bowls of chocolate, enormous potted meat sandwiches, and he ate them. This was in 1927. So our Lord, so our Lord told them to give the little daughter of Jairus something to eat. So plain and matter of fact, for so miracles are. There are intrusions, as we say, erring into real or ordinary life, but they do not, they do intrude into real life and so need ordinary meals and other results. Um, you know, so just that, a a note on that, like, um, the, what Tolkien is saying there is like, we commonly think of miracles as these intrusions into ordinary life, into, into reality, Mm -hmm. but really it's just God doing what he always does, which is, which is act, Mm -hmm. right? It's just in that some in some special in some way in some special way yes but with miracles it's they're just they draw more attention right like they're it's easier because it's not what we're used to right, right? exactly because it's kind of it's um, yeah it's kind of on a whole other plane of amazingness but they're not and but the point Tolkien I think is trying to make by saying that we err when we say that miracles are intrusions is that reality itself is a miracle the real, the reality we dwell within at all times is a miracle. Right. Right. But I, it's not, we don't, it's. But you, you, let me finish. Okay. Let me finish. So, because everything is held in being by God, right? Yes. Everything is made from nothing. Yes. Everything that we see around us is, is literally made from nothing. Yeah. God holds it in being. Right? Yeah. Yep. So the, nihil, the nihilists are right about something. <laughs> <laughs> we are nothing. That's right. We're made of nothing. So it's all deep. nothingness. Okay, it's all nothingness. All right, but but it's nothing, but it's everything at the same time because mm-hmm. God loves it and looks upon it and says that it's good. Mm-hmm. And sometimes he, intru- he sometimes he acts in this special way. These are the intru- these intrusions that we we speak about, right? As reminders, right? As extraordinary ways, They're, because really that's maybe a better way to put it. Is there extraordinary ways, not ordinary ways, right? That he acts, right? Yes. The action itself of 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 the world and of the cosmos is the ordinary way. Mm-hmm. Miracles are the extraordinary ways that he acts. Yes. Right. Yes. The extraordinary ways that he acts right. for our benefit to remind right. us that, Hey guys, I know that you can't see me and that your senses try to take over your, your spirit, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. I'm here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm in control. Right. Yeah. Okay. Trust me. I got this thing under control. Um, so, uh, of course, Father C could not resist adding, and there was a Capuchin friar who was mortally ill and had eaten nothing for years, and he was cured, and he was so delighted about it that he rushed off and had two dinners, and that night he had not he had not his old pains but an attack of plain ordinary indigestion, right? I love that little note, right? You know, this, yeah. here's this friar who's so happy that he's cured, and then he goes off and eats, and he, <laughs> he makes he eats so much he makes himself sick. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a great little note. So, um... So the little boy that he mentions... Yeah. 
was actually, that's interesting that he was healed by his interaction with the little girl that was healed. Right. Not with direct contact with the miraculous waters at Lourdes. Right. Right? So I, I love that because I feel like it's, um, I love that, you know, that it's showing that God, yes, he can work through extraordinary means. Mm-hmm. Right? But that he can also work through in extraordinary means, right? Like he's working through this little girl right. at this point. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, and but even in all the and the details of it, right? It's it, it's that's what's so fascinating about these miracles. So often is the details of it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, why does why does God act in this certain way? Why didn't He cure him in this other way? Right. 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 What was the additional part of it that came from playing with that little girl? Mm-hmm. Like, what was what was the takeaway from that? Well, yeah, exactly. That's a that's a fabulous question, and we you know. We can speculate, but there's no way to know. Well, there's no, well, that, but don't say the, the no way to know thing is, yeah, like there's not, like God isn't sitting there telling us, this is what I want you to think, but nevertheless, he gave you this, right? Oh, yeah. So what do you take totally. away from it, right? There are probably things you can reject, but there's certain things, but there's, but it's like, but it's just a lot, like it's a love note, right? It is a love note. And I think, and that's a, again, what, you know, kind of another thing about how, visions in addition you know healings these miracles in addition to visions they're individualized yeah. right they're personalized just like he mentioned just like Tolkien mentioned before that that light that garden angel was personalized for that particular moat right so this miracle for this little boy was personalized mm-hmm. for him and for his family and and the thing is it's it's a it's a contempt it's something to contemplate absolutely. right absolutely it's something oh, to con- not 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 just intellectually contemplate but to contemplate with your heart as mm-hmm. well what was God trying to say? Like mm-hmm. what? Mm-hmm. What was He trying to say through all this? And there's not an answer key for that question. No, there's not. But there is. There are things that we can know about God if we're paying attention, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And and there's and this is the way that God operates. God, we you know, God is not. He's not the He's not the sky fairy. He's not the clockmaker that's removed from from reality, right. right? That's just set things in motion and steps back, right? Right. No. But He's there. Yeah, and he he's has, ordering and he's, every... And he's speaking. Yeah. <laughs> he's speaking to us in various ways. Mm-hmm. And as we start, this is the thing about the people who kind of give themselves over entirely to contemplation, right? When you do that, and you just make that your way of life, you start seeing God everywhere. Now, mm-hmm. this is kind of lampooned as being like, well, you'll see God, you'll see God in the grilled cheese sandwich that you're eating. But, but why not? Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. That's the other thing. Now, that doesn't mean you rush out and you say, God wants us to all eat grilled cheeses. Right. Okay? Um, grilled cheeses. That's what I said, by the way. Uh, so, God, you know, that's that's not what we're saying. But what is God saying to you through this? Right? right? What is God saying? You know, maybe you hear this story in a particular context. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? You hear about this miraculous curing in a particular context. What is God saying to you? I mean, I think of... Um, you know, I've, I've, I've had experiences like this in my own life where little things happen that, you know, and it's hard for me to tell the stories because I'm like, how relevant is this really to you? Like, it doesn't prove anything. It mm-hmm. certainly doesn't prove to you that God exists or right. like that you should be a Christian or something like that. But it's, I'll tell you, experiencing it, living through it, it felt like God coming and, and saying like, I'm here. Mm-hmm. It, because a lot of times these things that I experienced happen in very difficult times and I still can't explain them. Yeah. Right. I still like... The operation of it, it's just like, that's, that's just too much of a coincidence. Right. No, yeah, absolutely. It's just but too again, much of a coincidence. that's what you needed at that point in that time. And that right. was God coming to you. And other people can benefit from those stories yeah. when they hear them, especially right. if they're going through their own difficulties too. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And if you're a, and if you're enough of a trustworthy person that they'll say, yeah, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. I hear you. you yeah, know? absolutely. I don't think you would just make that up. Right. 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 Um, so, um, okay. Uh, and what is Tolkien go like getting at with all this? What does he get really, what's he really getting at? Um, he says it's apparent sad ending and then it's sudden unhoped for happy ending. I was deeply moved and had that peculiar emotion we all have though. Not often. It is quite unlike any other sensation. And all of a sudden I realized what it was. The very thing that I've been trying to write about and explain in that fairy story, essay, i.e. on fairy stories, that I so much wish you had read, that I think I shall send it to you. For I coined the term eucatastrophe, the sudden happy turn in a story which pierces you with a joy, 
that brings tears, which I argued it is the highest function of fairy stories produce. And I was there led to the view that it produces its peculiar effect because it is a sudden glimpse of truth. Your whole nature chained in material cause and effect. The chain of death feels a sudden relief as if a major limb out of joint had suddenly snapped back. It perceives, if the story has literary truth on the second plane, for which see the essay, that this is indeed how things really do work in the great world for which our nature is made. And I concluded by saying that the resurrection was the greatest eucatastrophe possible in the greatest fairy story, and produces that essential emotion, Christian joy which produces tears because it is qualitatively so like sorrow, because it comes from those places where joy and sorrow are at one, reconciled as selfishness and altruism are lost in love. Um, of course, I do not mean that the Gospels tell, tell what is only a fairy story, but I do mean very strongly that they do tell a fairy story, the greatest. Man, the storyteller, would have to be redeemed in a manner consonant with his nature, by a moving story. But since the author of it is the supreme artist and the author of reality, this one was also made, made to, be, uh, to be true, the supreme, uh, to, be, to be true on the primary plane. So that in the primary miracle, the resurrection, and the lesser Christian miracles, uh, too, though less, you have not only the sudden glimpse of the truth behind the apparent ananke of our world, but a glimpse that is actually a ray of light through the very chinks of the universe about us. All right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, ananke, what is that term? That is, um, let's see, uh, necess- necessity constraint, mm-hmm. right? So it's, it's the, it's the seeming, it's the seeming constraint of our world, right? The walls of our world, mm-hmm. if you will, right? Mm-hmm. He, he talks about beyond the world. It's a peek behind the curtain. Behind the curtain. That's a great yeah. one, yeah. right? Ooh. I was going to say. Twin Peaks reference. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I've just heard you use that term. No, no, well. I, and I do. Yeah, I was just thinking of the curtain in Twin, Pe- Twin Peaks, which is always, you know, swaying there, right? Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. Um, but uh, we've been watching Twin, Twin Peaks lately. Mm-hmm. We're not gonna anyway, we're not going to go there right now. So, you know, this is, you got to go back. If you haven't read on fairy stories and if you haven't listened to our episodes on it, go back and read it and then listen to our episodes. Uh, just mind blowing stuff. Absolutely mind blowing. And it'll help you see reality in a whole new light. Um, but that's what Tolkien is getting at here. That's, that's what he refers mm-hmm. to. And he talks about you mm-hmm. catastrophe and he talks, he's, he listed all these things before these miracles as examples of you catastrophe. Right. Like that's actually happening in our world. Right. Mm -hmm. That actually happens in our world. And it's that unlooked for hope. It's Mm -hmm. that unlooked for happy ending, that happy Mm -hmm. turn in a story. Right. Just when you think all is lost. Right. Right. And the more I really think about like this is that's required in good storytelling. It's almost like it's required in good storytelling. It is. It's the climax. Right. It's the especially in a like tragedy. It might not be. But in comedy, it is. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm hmm. Um comedy it's that thing where like okay how do they, there's no way they can get out of this right they're done right 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 Be, based on the constraints that we know about this mm-hmm. about this story mm-hmm. they're done it's gonna take a miracle and then something something unlooked for happens mm-hmm. you know you think of star wars luke is about to get destroyed in the tie fighter mm-hmm. by the tie uh, by darth vader's tie fighter and he's all alone and all of a sudden you're like he's he's creating i mean he's getting shot out right then and then Boom, Han Solo returns, Millennium Falcon comes in mm-hmm. and saves the day, and then Luke gets off the shot that destroys the Death Star, right? I mean, that's that's you catastrophe right there, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. It's the Eagles. It's, right, it's I the was going to say, it's the Eagles, yeah. Or it's, you know, it's that, uh, it's the Battle of Gondor, right, with the Rohirrim coming in, right? When everything's looking dark and looks like they've lost, right? Well, and then... It's Aragorn on the ships, right? Aragorn on the ships, Aragorn that's right, on the yeah. ships coming in. Um, but you're right. I think it is. I think it is necessary. But I think also, um, I feel like so often, like if we're reading a book or watching a movie, I feel like it's very tempting, given our human nature, to see these things and be like, "That would never happen." Like that's just so unrealistic. Like, please, that's just, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I think that um, what we forget is that God can work that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it might seem unrealistic, right? You might it might just seem like good storytelling at the time, but if we're looking for those moments, God does give them to us. Maybe not on such an extraordinary, you know, brilliant scale, but they're there. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, you know, I guess, and I think there I, it, there might be people listening who kind of hear this and 
you know, think, okay, well, what's the point? I've never experienced any miracles. I've never experienced, you know, I wish God would give me some of those, especially Mm -hmm. if you face some kind of like huge tragedy in your life. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, it's not, it's not like God just makes it a point of you, you know, you experience a tragedy, the death of a loved one suddenly or something like that. Like what happened in Las Vegas is, you know, it's like, well, it sure would be great if God would kind of snap his fingers and bring all those people in Las Vegas back to life. Oh, right. Heck yeah. Or name any tragedy over the last, you know, over the last couple of years where it just seems like it's, ha- you know, just happens frequently. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it sure would be nice if that would happen. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. It would be, it sure would be nice. Mm-hmm. And, um, I- I'm, I'm not convinced that God will never act in such a way, uh, in, in this world that it will be kind of something that we can all see. And I pray that, you know, maybe that would happen because it sure would be nice to see that happen. But yeah. that's not really the point either. The point is, what Tolkien says here, right? That the, that the catastrophe of human history of the entirety of our story as the human race has already happened. The resurrection, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. The happy turn. Death is not, does not have the final say in our story. Right. It has been right? conquered. And yes, we have to trust, right? And who do we trust? going to be easy. We trust the one that says, I am the resurrection, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And that's what I'm proposing. That's, that's, that's where I strive to live my life. I mean, people, you know, you can still, you can still take, you know, jo- you know, you can still kind of take issue with that. And I, I recognize that people do, mm-hmm. um, and, and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, this is what Tolkien says. And this is something I realized a long time ago is that I want to go towards the one who says I am the resurrection. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and showed it. Right. 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 So you got nothing to lose. Right. right. Um, because, you know, that's what he says. I am the resurrection. And if you abide in me, then you are part of that resurrection, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, into eternal life, right? And not just not just eternal life in the disembodied spiritual sense, but in the sense of you're going to, you know, get your body back and it'll be glorified, just mm-hmm. like I got mine back and it was glorified, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, that's kind of what we point to as Christians as the you know as the end of as the end of history, right? Right. right. Um, is the final part of the story. So, um, okay, so. He and and this that's a great that's a good lead in to this particular part to the next part of the letter, where he talks about writing. You know, this is another vision he had. So he has he talks about the moat thing. Mm-hmm. You know, where yeah. he was in Eucharistic adoration, and then yeah. he says, "I was riding along on a bicycle the other day, uh, not so long ago, past the Radcliffe Infirmary, uh, at a hospital, when I had one of those sudden clarities which sometimes comes in dreams, even anesthetic produced ones. I remember saying aloud with absolute conviction." But of course, of course, that's how things really do work. But I could not reproduce any argument that had led to this, though the sensation was the same as having been convinced by reason, if without reasoning. And I have since thought that one of the reasons why one can't recapture the wonderful argument or secret when one wakes up is simply because there was not one. But there was, there was often maybe a direct appreciation by the mind, uh, but without the chain of argument we know in our time, serial life, serial life. Um, so, you know, I, I love this scene because it's just like, here's Tolkien do to do riding along on his bike one morning, right? And he drives past this hospital and all of a sudden he just says to himself, but of course, of course, that's how things really do work. No, he didn't say it to himself. He said it out loud. Well, that's what I'm saying. He said, more it, awesome. he said it, he said it out loud, but he, okay. but to himself, there was nobody else listening. Right. That's right? just awesome. I know. It's just, <laughs> I mean, this is like, this is like, that's exactly who you want Tolkien to be. You want uh-huh. him to be this, you want him to be this like middle-aged kind of like goofy professor who's yeah, just riding like riding along his bike and he's just like, he's like but of course of course eureka <laughs> of course that's the way things really do work um you know that just that just makes you love him even more um, absolutely and uh but what was he talking about he was talking about that that peering behind the curtain mm-hmm. he had this mm-hmm. epiphany riding by this hospital where all these sick pe- sick miserable people were yeah presumably yeah and he just, all of a sudden, he has this moment of joy from elsewhere. He's yeah. just filled with this moment of joy from elsewhere, yeah. saying, like, that's how reality works. The resurrection, right? Mm-hmm. Miracles. Mm-hmm. That's, how, that's how all this really works. We, we don't see this normally, and so it's hard, to, it's hard to think this, but that's how it really works. And he's like, I don't know where this came from, but made perfect sense. It's not like it was just this random sort of thing, but it was like, 
I was filled with this rash, almost rational certainty about it. Mm -hmm. Right. But without reasoning, um, I have since thought that one of the reasons why one can't recapture the wonderful argument or secret when one wakes up is simply because there was not one, but there was a direct appreciation by the mind, but without the chain of argument we know in our time serial life. Okay. So this is, this is interesting because, um, other saints have reported the same thing where, you know, we, we normally obtain knowledge about things through a kind of rational process, right? Mm -hmm. We look at the world, we, we have sensory perception and we're able to kind of formulate things based on, you know, the, what we see empirically, Mm -hmm. right? Sure. What we behold empirically with our, with our senses. Um, but there have been instances of the most rational of like saints, like, you know, good instance would be Thomas Aquinas. Um, Thomas Aquinas wrote volumes and is, you know, and it just, you know, was Mr. Reason, Dr. Reason, right? Yeah, you know, he yeah. was just Dr. Logic, mm-hmm. right? I mean, almost mm-hmm. like Vulcan in a sense. Um, and, and he would oftentimes, you know, he would talk about this where that's not the only way you can get knowledge, right? Yeah. Knowledge can come through this process of just like being infused, right? right. All of a sudden it's just part of you. Yes. Right. Yes. And it's ra- And it has the, it has the sensation of being rational knowledge, but it's infused knowledge, mm. right? It's knowledge about reality that's just given as a, as a grace, as a special grace, right? And um, you could arrive at it by reason if you were given the right data mm-hmm. to get it, mm-hmm. but you can just be given it as a special gift, right? Right. Yeah. And um, and I think that's you know what Tolkien is referring to. Yeah, here, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. That he was just kind of yeah. in a moment, and again, this is a grace, right? He's given this miraculous knowledge, right? Yeah. Um, of of course, that's the way things really work, Mm -hmm. right? That this Mm -hmm. is, that the happy turn is the way things really work. Yeah. It's the way they work. And I think, um, you know, a big, big reason for that is because, um, that's the story. The gospel story is the one that's imprinted on our heart, on our hearts Mm -hmm. and in our souls. Right. Because we're made in the image and likeness of God. Right. Right. Who became man through the person of Jesus Christ who died and rose again. Mm-hmm. that's the story. That's our story. Right. And so that's, you know, that's the one that all stories are going to harken back to. Right. Even our own personal stories. Right. Um, so I could go on and on. Well, no, 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 no. Wrong direction. No, but. it's good. No, it's good. And, um, and I think you're right. Like we all, I think we all intuitively, we kind of intuit this and not necessarily that everybody intuits it in the terms of like, well, uh, you know, we'll all just become a Christian then. But like, we all know that when a tragic ending happens, we're like, damn it, that's not the way it's supposed to work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like we all, and, and some of us become so numb to it that we just like, we, we convince ourselves that I guess that really is how it works. But Tolkien is saying like, no, no, let's not, for, let's not lose sight of the fact that that's, that's not how tragedy is and how things really work. Mm-hmm. That the happy ending is how things really do work. Right. Right. And that there can be the ha- a happy ending, even in what appears to be a tragic ending. And, and I think he, and, and this is one of the things that I love so much about Tolkien is he, he just, it's like he wants to remind the human race that the happy ending is still to be expected. Right. It's still to come. Right. 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 And, and this applies in the whole of our history, but this applies in our own lives as well. Mm-hmm. Right. And the, and the tragedies we face in this world, that when you face tragedy, the happy ending is still to come. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. We don't, we have no idea necessarily what that happy ending is going to look like. Right. Okay. Or when it's going to happen. Or when it's going to happen. Okay. Mm-hmm. But that happy ending is going to come. So yeah. don't lose heart. Right. right. Don't lose. Even, even when it seems like, and, and, you know, of course we read the Lord of the Rings and we li- read about like how, you know, there's no, there's no reasonable, there's no reasonable reason to have hope at this point, but still we must hope, mm-hmm. but still we must, we must. Yeah. We, you know, it's like. Or we're going to become Denethor. We all just become Denethor. Exactly. Right. When you, when you fail to hope is when you, um, despair sets in. Right. Yeah. And, um, uh, but this is something that we have to constantly remind ourselves. It's not easy. It's right. It's not easy, especially, you know, we talked at the very beginning about, you know, how, what, how two tragedies have happened in the, you know, this is only, 
you know, we're only midweek and we've already had two significant tragedies this week, yeah. right? Well, and more. I mean, you know, who knows well, what other more, tragedies there are of. in the world you right, know, going exactly. on. I mean, you think about Puerto Rico right, right. now and what a... You just, think about the earthquake in Mexico. I mean... Incredible disasters, you know, the, the hurricanes that have happened mm-hmm. in Houston and then in Florida. I mean, my gosh, you yeah. know, it just seems like... It goes on and on and on. It seems like tragedy is humanity's real story. Yeah. You know, that, that it, it's not... It's certainly... Feels more reasonable that tragedy is humanity's oh, story. Oh, absolutely. But if you look closely, even in these, you know, even in these tragic events, there is, there are glimmers, right, of this coming happy ending. Right. There are, there is good that is coming and will come from it. Yeah, you maybe, have to be looking for maybe it. Maybe that's like the central message of this letter, right? Is like the Tolkien wants us to keep in mind is that. You see the tragedy, and the tragedy seems overwhelming. It seems like this flood of misery and misfortune. And he, again, he's writing this letter in the face of one of the greatest tragedies mm-hmm. in human history, which was World War II, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and what does he do? He looks at his son being in this war, and he says, and he thinks about, he just reflects upon this speck of dust and God's mm-hmm. love for this speck of dust. Mm-hmm. And you know, takes that to the level of, well, if God loves this speck of dust, then how much more does he love us? Right, right, right. And as you want, want what's best for us. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's what Tolkien is trying to say. You know, he doesn't come right out and say it because he's just writing kind of a personal letter and he's not even sure exactly what he's trying to say here. But he's conti- he's keeping it continuous with On Fairy he Stories, is. which he wrote years yeah. ago, right? Mm-hmm. He wrote seven years before this. Mm-hmm. And we see it play out in Lord of the Rings. And he's saying, look in the face of tragedy, look for look for God in the quiet moments. Right. Mm-hmm. And we see, we see that in the old Testament, right? Like God is saying, I'm not in the earthquake. I'm not in the fire. Mm-hmm. I'm here in that still small, small voice, still voice. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. I'm here in that still small voice. Look for that. Mm-hmm. Look for that. And you'll find me. And the noise of this world, that's even, you know, it's made almost impossible. <laughs> it seems impossible. Yeah. yeah. But, but yeah, I, this is obviously a very hopeful, hopeful letter. Right. I mean, that's, that's just the only word I can think of. It's just hope. I feel like it's just. And I'll tell you, I mean, it's hard. It's every it, word. It's hard to look to listen for that still small voice. Oh, it's so yeah. hard. But like that's, it's almost like that's what we have to resolve to do. Yes. You know. Yes. Yeah. It and it takes a constant. It's it takes a lot of emotional energy, right? And it takes a constant reminder, because it's it's much easier to slip into despair and hopelessness than it is to remind yourselves that there is a happy ending. Mm-hmm. There will be a happy ending at some point. Right. That can be, it's, it's hard. It's hard to do that. Well, and I, and I feel like, um, you know, so we, we kind of talked about how the, you know, Tolkien's idea that Christ is the center of the story of human history. And, and, you know, there, I'm sure there are people who are li- listening to the story that are not Christians. And, and, and again, like, I want to say, like, I, I believe that, and you believe that and Tolkien believe that. Um, I think, I think even before we jump, if you feel like we're jumping to that conclusion, like we want to say that the story, Christ himself, we also call him the logos, which means he is the reason, mm-hmm. right? Yes. And so that reason that we feel that, that feeling that, man, this cannot be the end of things, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That's what we mean, right? That Christ, even before we know him as Christ, we know Christ as, as that thing we feel like has to be the happy ending, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Even before we know him and all the specifics of Christianity, we kind of, he's that sense that we have that this cannot be the way the story ends. Right. 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 And also that our faith is not unreasonable, right? Mm -hmm. There is reason for it. Because God himself is the reason. True. And in the big picture, it's, you know, it's saying like, like he, when you look at, when you look at the stars, when you look at the harmony in various ways about the world, that's him coming through. That's yeah. him behind it. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And, Absolutely. and that's what we mean by Christ as the logos, even before we know him as the, as, as we mean the son of God as logos, even before we know him as Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. right. As mm-hmm. the person who lived in, um, in Galilee and, uh, you know, all those years ago. Mm-hmm. All right. So we need, you know, so let's, let's move on a little bit. He makes reference to the eagles as part mm-hmm. of this, um, and he said, and this is before he's finished the Lord of the Rings, and he's, you know, he's just saying, just as I just finished this last part of the Ring, and um, and I'm sending it to you, so you know, I hope you'll enjoy it. It also involves eagles, 
And then he has this little curious thing that he talks about with this beggar that he meets outside of St. Gregory's. Yeah. Um, I saw the most touching sight there, leaning against the wall as we came out of church was an old tramp in rags, something like sandals tied on his feet with string, an old tin can on one wrist, and in his other hand a rough staff. He had a brown beard and a curiously clean face with blue eyes, and he was gazing into the distance in some rapt thought, not heading, uh, not heeding any of the people, certainly not begging. I could not resist the impulse of offering him a small alms, and he took it with grave kindliness and thanked me courteously and then went back to his contemplation. Just for once, I rather took Father Sia back by saying to him that I thought the old man looked a great deal more like St. Joseph than the statue in the church. At any rate, St. Joseph on the way to Egypt. He seems to be, and what a happy thought in these shabby days where poverty seems only to bring sin and misery, a holy tramp. I could have sworn it anyway, but uh, Priscilla says Betty told her that he had been at the early mass and had been to communion, and his devotion was plain to see, so plain that many were edified. I do not know just why, but I find that immensely comforting and pleasing. Father C says he turns up about once a year. So in the midst of all this, we have this little reflection on, Mm -hmm. you know, this holy, this holy tramp, you know, who's who's not actually begging. He's just sitting outside, like contemplating, Mm -hmm. you know, he doesn't even know what he's looking at. I mean, what, what, what do you think Tolkien's getting at with this? Like, (laughs) it's just kind of an odd little thing to throw in there. It is an odd little thing, but, um... I th- I think it's um, you know I I think there's a couple of things going on. I think first of all it's um, you know he talks about it, I think it's kind of a reminder to not judge things from the exterior, mm-hmm. right? Even though he appears to be extremely poor, and he most likely is a poor beggar. Right. He's obviously there's something because again we're all made in the image of likeness of God and mm-hmm. li- likeness of God, right? So so there is the, this beggar is holy, mm-hmm. right? And, um, and I love that he references St. Joseph, right? Because, I mean, uh, I'm not saying that, he, that Tolkien is saying that this was St. Joseph. He just said it looks like him. But I think it's also rem- a reminder to look for the poor, mm-hmm. right? To see, the, to see Jesus in the poor. That's what right. I'm trying to say. To see holiness in the poor. Because, mm-hmm. um, again, I think that can be difficult to do. Because as human beings, I feel like we're often just focused on the exterior, on the surface level of things, right? And I think this is an encouragement to go deeper. Because mm-hmm. I think often you'll be surprised if you let yourself go to that, you know, go deeper to, to look past what's on the outside. Um, and I, you know, often, and I, I know that, that um, you know, that, that saints can take on physical form, right? I mean, yeah. angels can take on physical form. So this very well could have been St. Joseph. Mm-hmm. But he wouldn't, you know, if, Saint, if if Tolkien hadn't been in tune with his surroundings, you know, the way he was, um, if he hadn't looked past the exterior, he, he would have never seen that. So I think it's just another encouragement to just be looking for the hand of God in every moment of our lives. What do you think? No, I, I, I think you're right. And I think... Um, I think the, like the poor, like, uh, Catholics place a huge emphasis on, on, uh, on the poor and on, on paying attention poor, to the poor yeah. and, and care for the poor and, and friendship with the poor. Um, and that's something that I've, I've certainly, I deeply appreciate about having, uh, you become Catholic is just a kind of a greater attention, mm-hmm. needing to pay greater attention you know, acknowledge mm-hmm. that, you know, cause it's so easy to, you, the poor person can be so easy to ignore, mm-hmm. unfortunately, yeah, because we're so shallow. Yeah. And, um, and I think, <clears throat> gosh, what I take away from this, there's, you know, there's so many things, but I think this is just another instance of what Tolkien is referring to, which is like looking for the, looking for the quieter moments, not expecting mm-hmm. to see God in like the big events, but but in paying attention to, to the things. quieter things, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. To the quieter things, and of and of understanding that when you start to see the world in this way, in this contemplative way, mm-hmm. in this kind of joyful curiosity, um, you start seeing God everywhere. Like you start yeah. realizing that He's speaking to you every, in everything. Yeah, I love right? that joyful curiosity. And, it, and it's yeah. not it's not a rational didactic way of speaking. It's not it's not a um, it's not this like. Let me explain to you in, in exact detail how I'm speaking to you, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like a teacher, like, you know, this is, he's a poet, right? Mm-hmm. He's speaking to us in images, right? Mm-hmm. In, uh, in things that affect us on, 
on a rational level, yeah, but but can affect us on a much deeper level as well on our emotions. I, I'm teaching mm-hmm. a poetry class to middle schoolers and high schoolers right now, and one of the things we're talking about in this class is is like that poetry communicates on a deeper than rational level, right? It's mm-hmm. it it mm-hmm. speaks to our emotions mm. first, maybe first and foremost, and and it and it speaks to us in words. Yeah, there's there's truth to it, but there's also images and there's also sounds yeah. that happen. Yeah. Right. And I think that kind of points us to how God tends to speak to us in in the in everyday life, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's why we have to be a little more deep. We have we to have be slower. To be we have to tune. slow down. We have to be. We, exactly. ha- we, we have to tune out the world more and mm-hmm. tune in what's going on just around us and everything mm-hmm. like Tolkien is doing here, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, between um, a couple of just kind of you know little scripture references, kind of popped into my head here is you know just with re- regards to this beggar, you know. Is you do to the least of me, you do unto me, right? Yeah. Um, so it's least of these, you do unto me. Least of these, you do yeah. unto me, yeah. Um, but then also <laughs> that, um, you know, the last shall be first, the first shall be last. Um, how God chooses to, um, you know, exalt the lowly, mm-hmm. right? The whole beatitudes, right? Right. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God, right? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Yeah. Right? And so you just, you think about this image of the beggar here, and then you think about the little boy being healed through his interaction with the little girl, mm-hmm. right? Again, it's like that, it's just making you think of like childlike faith, right? With that little girl. And, and also, um, you know, just being just, you know, it, just kind of having a, just this Christ-like outlook on the, on the world. Cause it is very countercultural. It's yeah. super hard to do. Mm-hmm. So, well, and, um, it's not only countercultural, but it's, it's counter reality, right? It's like, it's mm-hmm. counter what we think of as reality, right? Right. It's, yeah. It's daring to. It's it's daring not to not to dis, like it's not like we're saying like the reality as we see it is not true, but we're saying there's more going on than just what we see right. on the surface level. Yes, right. Yes. We're not denying that the things are. It's not like we're saying all of this is just shadows and we're some kind of weird gnostic teaching some weird kind of, kind of weird gnosticism. No, the world around us is true, and we can scientific inquiry. Mm-hmm. All those kind of things are good things, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, and they speak to truth, but yeah. there's there's something deeper going on in the world. And it's not what we see on the surface level is not, it's not all there is. It's not this, it's not the whole story. Right. There's, there's a rest that we got to pay attention to the rest of the story. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's, I, I love this because Tolkien's not even sure why he feels the need to bring this up, but he does. And, um, and it's, it's just, it's fascinating. I, you know, I, I reminded of my, um, you know, my grandfather, my mom's dad, uh, Boomy, uh, who passed away a few years ago. Um, but was, uh, you know, I I remember being in Philadelphia with him one time Mm -hmm. and walking, he, he, he always paid, he was always very attentive to the poor, uh, good, just a good Christian in that way. Like always very attentive to the poor. Um, and he walking down the street, we were, we were walking down the street in Philadelphia on a cold night. And there was this like, you know, person, um, homeless person, like, who may have been blind. I couldn't, you know, they, their eyes didn't seem to be working properly. Hmm. Um, it was just like, they were like playing a recorder or something like that, hmm. you know, and they had a little can or something there, like just asking for money and a bunch of people had already walked by and, you know, Boomy drops in some money. I'm not sure how much money it was, but it doesn't, doesn't really matter, yeah, yeah. but he just drops in some money and, and, you know, and we walked by a little bit more and then person said, thank you very much. And went back to playing and, and, um, and I think he may have said, God, Boomy may have said, God bless you. And, you know, kept walking by him. Mm-hmm. Um, and he turned to me and he said, you know, said something along the lines of, you know, John, that could have been, um, that could have been the Lord Jesus mm-hmm. right there, mm-hmm. you know, playing the recorder. Yeah. Right. It could have been. Well, and, and, and on a deeper, even deeper level in some way, Jesus identifies so much with the poor that it was not yeah. necessarily the actual person mm-hmm. of Jesus, but mm-hmm. in like a in a hidden way, you know, he was, he was present. He has such, he has such unity with the poor. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And and what are the poor? Like the poor bring us, um, I think one thing I've also realized about, um, the poor or the weak or, you know, because the poor is, it's not just homeless people. The poor can be poor in various ways. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, impoverished in certain ways. Right. Um, it could be the sick. It could be, 
children who are um, in difficult situations. You know, it could be mm-hmm. people who are just in difficult situations, mm-hmm. right? Um, what do they remind us of? Well, they remind us of that there's a, the, the reason Jesus wants us to pay attention to them is because, A, he loves them. They're made, they, they have dignity and we can forget that all too easily because we're so, so shallow, mm-hmm. but B, they also show us who we really are, right? In a spiritual sense, right? Yeah. That, and that blessedness comes in having all of the pomp and the circumstance and the ridiculous stuff that we care about in this world stripped away mm. and realizing who you really are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and giving yourself over to God to be changed. Right. Yes. Yes. Um, anyway, mm-hmm. I, you know, I didn't want this to become like preachy and, and I really am not trying to be there, but I just love this letter. And, mm-hmm. um, and you know, in the midst of all the sorrow and the sadness and the tragedy in the world, you know, this is, this is why I love Tolkien so much. Like he just, he brings me hope and he gives me a light, you know, mm-hmm. a light to walk, walk by in this world. Yeah, right? absolutely. And you know, um, what's interesting is when I first read this, I was kind of like, what is going on here? Like, this is not making any sense. But now that we've spent this time talking about it, I'm like, oh, this totally... Like, at first I thought it was kind of a stream of consciousness, not really being connected in any particular way. But now I'm like, oh my gosh, like, this is brilliant. Like, it is all connected. It's not obvious on the surface, right? At first reading, I don't think. I don't think it's obvious on how, on his train of thought and how it's all, you know, being connected here. But it is. Yeah. It's all a unified whole. Right. I love it. Amen. Um, well, so, you know, he, he, he kind of starts to wrap things up and says, well, this is becoming a very peculiar letter. Um, I, you know, and again, just love that. He recognizes like his own, his own weirdness. Um, yeah. that's why we love you. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I don't know that I, we need to go too much into, if, if you found anything interesting in the last couple of paragraphs, that's fine. He does reference C.S. Lewis a couple of times, which mm-hmm. is always neat. Yeah. Um, but nothing, you know, terribly, um, terribly like fascinating on the subject we've been talking about. With yeah, this just letter. more of it's funny. I feel like he's kind of been in like this um, existential like reality for the last for the three first three quarters yeah. of his letter, and now he's like, all right, back to earth. Right. <laughs> this is what I did yesterday, and then Tuesday I did this, and oh yeah, I hung out with Lewis and Williams a yeah. little bit, and you know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's funny he's kind of bringing it back down to earth. Yeah. Um, after an extended meditation, which I guess. You know, that's where we're at now. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, just go read the letter if you haven't already. Um, it's beautiful. We'd love to hear yeah. your, your thoughts on it, on our discussion. Um, maybe we're both crazy, but we hope that in the midst <laughs> of, uh, we're, but at least we're crazy along with Tolkien. Exactly. I can handle that. We're in good company. Um, we'll take it. You know, I just hope that in the midst of everything that's going on in the world right now, um, that this maybe you know, Tolkien's letter and then kind of some of our reflections and contemplations of it provide everybody listening with a little light in the darkness. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's what we're all, we're all looking for. We're all looking to be reminded that the darkness, though it seems so dark about us right now is not, does not have the final say. It doesn't. And it's often when things seem the darkest, right? That, that, that light is imminent, Mm -hmm. right? Isn't that, there's that saying, the night is darkest just before the dawn. Mm-hmm. Right. And so the question is, we have to find, you know, we have to ask ourselves, well, where do I find that light? Mm-hmm. Right. Where do I find that light? And that, you know, as human beings, that's a question we all need to be asking ourselves. First of all, believe there is a light. And second mm-hmm. of all, say, where is it? Yeah. You know, how do I get it? Amen. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope it, I hope it's a bless. I hope this has been a blessing to you and we appreciate everybody listening. Very much. Um, special thanks to our patrons, executive producers, Dr. William Hutton, Justine Lloyd, and our other awesome patrons, as well as Shannon, uh, Shannon Stockbridge, Josh Sosa, Brian Orr, Margaret Lyon, Emilio Perea, Zeke Farmer, Caleb Santana, James Applegate, Caitlin Fascista, Matt Scarrance, Al Taylor, Per Brenner, James Lindbergh, Chris Loftus, Lawrence McGowan, and Richard Wall. We are so appreciative of you all. Very much. And yes, your contributions. thank you guys. And, um, and if you'd like to become a patron, please head on over to TolkienRoad.com or Patreon.com slash TolkienRoad. Yep, yep. All right. Next time, we need your feedback on the future of Middle Earth. So go back and listen to the episode if you haven't already. Or uh, if you have, send us an email at TolkienRoadPodcast at gmail.com. Do it. We got to hear from you to make that episode awesome. That's so. exactly right. All right. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yes, thank you, guys. Greta, thanks for your time. Thank you, John. It's All been right. lovely. Lovely indeed. All right, we'll talk at you next time. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.
Please remember to check out truemyths.org and tolkienroad.com for show notes and plenty of other Tolkien goodness. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave the Tolkien Road a rating and feedback on iTunes, and consider supporting us financially via patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. On our next episode, we'll continue our discussion of the future of Middle-earth that we started on the last. Please send your thoughts and correspondence to Tolkien Road Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and until next time, the road goes ever on.